Yeah, it's that time, so uh, why don't I go ahead and get started. Uh, so what we're going to do today is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, start up where I left off uh, last Monday, uh, where we started talking about uh, started talking about the process of modeling ordinal data, and in particular uh, using cumulative logit models for modeling that ordinal data. So I'll go ahead and start off by um, uh, going back over the, the one slide about cumulative logit models that we sort of ended the session with on Monday. Let me go ahead and bring this up full screen. Okay, so again, we're, uh, what we're working with is ordinal data. So we're imagining we've got uh, something measured on an ordinal scale. And the example I gave here was of pain measurements that might re be reported on an escalating scale going from none to mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe. Uh, and again, often those measurements are reported then on a numerical scale like 1 to 5 or 0 to 4 or something like that uh, as a way of coding that kind of information. And then this is in contrast with a non-ordinal or a non-ordered categorical scale such as, uh, you know, you could have something like maybe uh, the state that a patient lives in, for example. In that instance, then, of course, it could be as, uh, if we're staying within the U.S. anyway, it could be as many as 50 different levels of that categorical var variable, but there's really no natural ordering. Uh, of that variable. So that would not be an ordinal scale. Uh, so anyway, but we're going to be talking about ordinal scales. Uh, and the basic idea we're going to have is in these cumulative logit models is to convert those ordinal measurements into what amounts to a collection of binary outcomes we're talking about here. And once we do that, then we can model those binary outcomes using the same sort of strategies that we did for binary measurements. Uh, and in particular, what we're going to focus on here will be logistic regression models for those binary outcomes. And because we're dealing with these sort of cumulative probabilities for each one of these possible binary cases, they're called cumulative logit, logit models. So the, the, the the form of a cumulative logit model that I'm going to talk about here uh, is we're going to consider the case where we've uh, we've taken our ordinal score and converted it to a set of integers going from 1 up to capital M. And in this case then our our very we'll call our variable here our, our dependent variable here yi so that's our actual observed score that's going to be distributed according to just a simple categorical uh, uh, a categorical uh, probability distribution uh, and the parameters of that will be uh, this p sub i which will be a vector of probabilities so you'll have one probability associated with each one of the levels from 1 to m so p will then be a vector of m values uh, it'll have the properties that, of course, each p will be somewhere between 0 and 1, and they and if you sum them all up, uh, they would add up to 1, because the assumption here is that all values will take a, um, take a value between 1 and m. And, of course, they depend upon our model parameters and our covariates here. Uh, so for if we consider one particular element, then, of this vector pi, we'll call pi m here where m is now a lowercase m that's going to be used to represent the probability that our observation equals m again that depends on our parameters and covariates uh, and then we can write that probability in terms of the difference between the cumulative probabilities uh, so and by cumulative probabilities I mean this where we're looking at the probability that y is less than or equal to m so, for example, if I said y is less than or equal to 2, that would mean the, the probability that y equals uh, 1 or 2 uh, in that example. Uh, and then I subtract from that the probability that y is less than or equal to m minus 1, and that difference will equal then the uh, probability that y equals m. But now think about the fact that, see, probability that y equals m is a... Now we're dealing with a, 
a probability where there's going to be a unique value for each one of our levels of m and we have to worry about all of them uh, in a sense we can we can deal with each one of these cumulative probabilities separately because the probability that y is less than or equal to m uh, and the probability of y is greater than m provides a a simple pair of probabilities that includes all possible cases and we can model that dichotomy uh, using the methods that we did for, we used for binary variables that's the basic idea and in particular we're going to use essentially a log logistic regression in this case to describe those cumulative probabilities and we're going to write it in a form that you see in the right hand side here where we've got a we've got a model where we've got some intercept term here this alpha sub m and then subtract from that this function of our covariates and our and our model parameters in here uh, and in the the typical uh, sort of standard cumulative logit model, the only thing that varies with M, with, with the score itself, will be the intercept term uh, in here. Uh, now one thing that has to be true in order for the probabilities to make sense is these alpha terms here, these alpha M's, have to be ordered. Uh, so another in particular alpha 1 will be less than alpha 2, less than alpha 3, and so on up to alpha less than, uh, or I'm sorry, the alpha m minus 2 will be less than alpha m minus 1. Uh, one thing here is notice I've only got m minus 1 values, but we've got m levels of scores. Well, that, that makes sense if you think about it because alpha sub capital M here, well, essentially it has to be infinity because we know that the probability that y is less than or equal to capital M has to equal 1. So it's really not necessary to have an intercept term for every possible score level. We only need it for m minus 1 of them, for, you know, for all but 1. And here. Um, so again, the, under this model then, the, the cumulative probabilities for our ordinal scores then share a common model, the RF term here, except for the intercept, which is unique to each one of the score levels. So let's say a little bit more about that in the next slide here. Uh, the, the stuff on top here is just uh, repeating what you saw in the previous slide, so we can reference it here. Uh, so as I pointed out, there's one less alpha term uh, than there are numbers of levels. Uh, also mentioned, in order to enforce this ordering, uh, the typical way of doing that is to parameterize your model in terms of in terms of these cumulative sums. So in other words, alpha any alpha m here is just going to be the sum from one to m of what I'll just call here delta alpha which will be the differences between the alphas. So, and if in particular, if we enforce the constraint that delta alpha is greater than zero for all of our i's greater than two, then we enforce this constraint. In other words, we're requiring that alpha two minus alpha one is greater than zero, and then alpha three minus alpha two is greater than zero, and so on and by by parameterizing it in that way it makes it fairly simple to enforce this this ordering constraint so that's typically the way we'll code it uh just mentioned that uh notice in the way i wrote this before these probab cumulative probabilities were always written as y less than or equal to m uh you can also write the model using that inequality in reverse order uh, and this is just writing the, the same model except reversing that. So now we're taking the differences uh, sort of the other way around. Uh, in this, uh, it also reverses the inequalities uh, that occur for our intercept term as part of this. And consequently, there's a slightly different approach to parameterizing it. So they're, they're both essentially equivalent and and you'll see in the literature both methods being used in different situations. There's off the top of my head, I don't know of any particular reason for choosing one uh, versus the other. I think it's more a matter of convention.
For the most part, I think I'll be using uh, the this approach, although I just realized the example I guess I'm going to give is uh, initially is actually going to be using uh, this particular ordering. Uh, well, we'll see why in a minute. Uh, a few properties of these cumulative logit models uh, is cumulative logit models have the property of what's called proportional odds. In fact, you'll often hear them referred to as being proportional odds models as a result of this. So recall that odds here are simply uh, taking a probability and dividing it by 1 minus that probability. So that represents odds rather than probabilities. So here in this example here, I'm illustrating it by taking uh, the, the odds here for uh, the for our probability of y being less than or equal to m given our model parameters and a particular set of covariates that I called x1. So I say I've gotten written as probabil that probability over 1 minus that probability in the numerator. And then I divide it by uh, the same thing except now for a different set of covariates. So it's the same score. Uh, we're talking about y less than or equal to m, same parameter values, but different covariates. When you take that ratio, what you find is, is the, the score drops out. You end up with relationships here that only involve the uh, our, our basic model function without our model without our score specific value of the intercept. So as I say here, in other words, that cumulative odds ratio of the same score for two different sets of covariate values end up being independent of the score. You can also turn this around a slightly different way. Uh, it turns out that the cumulative odds ratio for different scores for the same set of covariate values then end up being independent of the covariates. And I show that here. Here you can see I've got probability y less than or equal to m and probability that it's less than or equal to some n, where m and n might be different uh, values here. But the covariate values are the same in this case. And notice on the right-hand side, now we have something that depends only on uh, that intercept value uh, this, the, over here and do, do not depend upon the covariates. Uh, so again, those are two consequences of the proportion, proportional odds property uh, of the model. And they also provide some ideas in terms of how one might uh, test whether or not uh, the proportional odds assumption seems to be appropriate for a given model. Uh, because there are certainly extensions to the model we're using where uh, perhaps this function f over here may also depend upon the score level in some way. Uh, they do become more difficult models to implement, however. Okay, uh, there's another way of viewing these kinds of models and that's to interpret them in uh, in terms of what I refer to here as a latent variable interpretation of the model and sometimes that's a useful uh, interpretation both for implementation and maybe just for uh, for conceptual reasons uh, so what we can do is we can interpret these cumulative logit models in terms of some underlying continuous regression model and if we then take that continuous regression model and let's suppose that the observed ordinal variable, our y, equals m when the observed continuous response value, which we'll call z, uh, has a value between our alpha m minus 1 and alpha m. Okay, so again, we've got z as our continuous latent variable, that under that unobserved continuous response. If we then uh, assign the value of y uh, in the case, of, well, we'll assign that, we'll, to y we'll assign the value of m when z happens to fall between in the interval between alpha m minus 1 and m. Uh, so, that, so if we interpret the model in that way, well, it turns, if we go a step further here, if it turns out that z is distributed according to a logistic distribution, uh, with a mean equal to this f, our f of xi and theta, uh, and has a scale parameter equal to 1, uh, it, 
it turns out that if you go through the uh, calculations here, here what I'm doing is writing that out. So in other words, so our the probability that y is less than or equal to m is equivalent to saying the probability that z is less than or equal to alpha m. And if we then just take our, what I've done here is I've taken the density function for the logistic distribution, plugged it in here. I integrate from minus infinity to alpha m to get our cumulative probability. That becomes the term you see on the right, which is equivalent to the inverse logit of our alpha m minus f, uh, f of x, which is exactly the same. Go back up here. Um, is exactly the same as the model that we've got right here. Because if we just take the inverse logit on both sides, we end up in the same place. So, so the, the end result of that is just making the point that that's just another way that you can interpret, uh, interpret the model. And it, and it can come in handy um, in terms of constructing models in some instances where, um, where there may be some logical reason to conceptualize a model in terms of such an underlying continuous outcome. Um, okay, so that's that's the core model structure we're going to be working with. Uh, actually, I we won't be working directly with the latent variable interpretation, though what we're doing is equivalent to thinking about it in those terms. So we're going to be working with our, our cumulative logit model. I guess before I actually go through an example here, let me uh, see if there's any questions at this point. It can take a little while to get your head around cumulative logit models the first time. So. See nothing popping up yet. I'll start moving on, but I'll keep my eye open for anything that might crop up. What I'm going to do for an example is actually take some. Uh, uh, a little piece of work that we did uh, actually a few years ago. In fact, because of some of the changes that have happened to non-MEM, with non-MEM 7, I suppose this has gotten a little long in the tooth in a way, even though it's a relatively small number of years since it was done. Uh, but I, I still think it's it's useful, and in the process we actually, uh, d you know, we get a chance to describe a bug's implementation of uh, oh, a cumulative logit model that we can use then as a pattern for when we do a hands-on example. Okay, so we're going to tell a little story here uh, where we're going to be looking at modeling longitudinal data and in particular we're going to look at the comparative performance of an approximate maximum likelihood method and, and the example here will be non-MEM, in particular non-MEM 6 for this example and uh, comparing that to using MCMC uh, and actually I say well for I say for example wind bugs actually for this case I used um, excuse me I used open bugs but the the method is equivalent in this case okay so let me give you a little context uh, for this and what motivated uh, going through here uh, there was some work uh, that came out of um, Uppsala uh, this is when this is what 2004 for the most part yes uh, and I get, I think the or, yeah, I think the order was actually the the first article or the second article. I think was the first one, uh, where uh, an article was published here uh, describing uh, bias occurring uh, in population parameters when looking at repeated measures ordinal data using uh, non-MEM and the SAS NL mixed procedure, uh, and and they, they found some serious biases and and actually in that particular article proposed one strategy for trying to deal with it uh, and then uh, there was another article uh, that uh, 
actually I was just trying to see if I can I guess I can't really tell which one came out first uh, another one that where they described a so-called backstep method to try and correct those biases so let me briefly uh, point out some work the, the results from those uh, so in the one uh, well both of them involve some, using simulation to explore uh, the performance of of those estimation methods with ordered categorical outcomes. Uh, for the example they were working with here, uh, it was an ordered categorical response that had four levels. Uh, they used the non-mem Laplacian method and that resulted in some estimation and prediction biases and that was particularly true when the data were sort of skewed to one extreme or and by skewed into one extreme it essentially means if you had some of the score levels were were fairly rare whereas others were were fairly predominant uh so that that caused problems also if the inter individual variation was large uh that that also tended to be associated with higher levels of bias uh and when looking at simulations for doing uh, predictions as they found out that the probabilities of rare events were overestimated part of that and then they proposed in those two papers a couple of different approaches for remedying that bias one was the backstep method mentioned in the one article and the other was using a, a Gaussian quadrature method uh, that's available within SAS And the results you're looking at here, those that were reported in, um, you know, in the one paper here. Uh, and let me point out the, the cases we're looking at. So first of all, the y-axis here is the relative bias. And the uh, x-axis here are just different parameters within, those, within the model that they had used uh, in what they called condition one and, and more about the differences in these conditions in a minute. But under condition one, the, the two methods, either uh, what they called method standard here, STD, that was just, that was non-MEM. And then uh, the second one here, this BSM with the backstep method, which was, which involved applying non-MEM in, in an iterative scheme. Uh, that was that attempted to correct for the bias. Now, in the, in, under their so-called condition one, they, there wasn't much difference. Uh, in here, under condition two, you can see that with the backstep method, things were pretty good. But for uh, the standard non-mem Laplacian method, some of the parameters had pretty high biases associated with them. And similarly, for condition three, you get a similar picture where you have some fairly high biases uh, in the standard non-MEM method, but they seem to be improved using the uh, the backstep method. Uh, this next plot was what was reported. I think that was in the. I'm wondering if I yeah this was the other paper uh, where they were mainly comparing non-MEM to uh, NL mixed, uh, the, the, which is the SAS procedure. In here, uh, it's a similar thing you're looking at here. Again, we're looking at uh, at bias. Uh, they called it, in this case, relative estimation error. But again, that's essentially the same metric we're looking at. Uh, and we've got the uh, first two cases over here are just two different implementations of the Laplacian approximation to the ma to the likelihood function. And you can see in there, you've got some of the parameters have some pretty substantial biases associated with them with this one scenario. And I sort of covered that up. But uh, the scenario in this case differs by uh, the magnitude of the inter-individual variability. It's relatively small on the first set of panels on top, and it's quite large in the bottom set of panels. So you see biases in both cases, but they're particularly extreme in the case of the uh, uh, the high inter-individual variation. Uh, they found that if they use the centering option with non-MEM, that improved things a bit. Uh, you know, it certainly got things much closer to, to where they ought to be, uh, if though not exactly optimal. Uh, and then these other th three cases are all 
variations on using Gaussian quadrature as it's implemented in SAS and L mixed and, and you can see across the board that it's it's generally doing better. Now the the net conclusion out of this or the the net diagnosis I guess out of all of this is that the problem here is somehow related to the approximation that's used in with the Laplacian method uh, with because you're you're taking an integral uh, that's part of the uh, the likelihood function and you are approximating the solution to that integral using this Laplacian method and no matter how many iterations you throw at or anything it's always an approximation uh, so if you have some aspect of the model that makes that approximation particularly poor you're going to be you know you're going to in introduce uh, some problems in in terms of bias and that's that's basically what this is showing now with the Gaussian quadrature method I suppose in some sense it's still an approximation but it's an approximation that you can make arbitrarily good by uh, by doing things like increasing the number of uh, you know the the number of breakpoints and so on as part of that quadrature Okay, so that's what they were looking at. Well, one of the things that, you know, being a fairly regular user of an MCMC method, uh, you know, of course I recognize that with MCMC, though we have an iterative solution and that introduces some, uh, some degree of approximation, if you like. It's an approximation that can get arbitrarily uh, that can be reduced as, as much as you want if you're willing to wait long enough to do enough iterations. Uh, so in principle, you're, you're not really approximating the, the likelihood in the same sense that you do with something like the Laplacian. So, you know, so in theory, I, I should be able to do a better job with MCMC than with the Laplacian. I would not necessarily do a better job than, uh, than Gaussian quadrature, though I do get you know the benefits that are associated with the Bayesian method when that's particularly valuable for a given context. Okay, so so with our if I use Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation, then uh, I'll get my results in the form of samples from a joint posterior. Uh, it shouldn't produce the same kind of biases as the Laplacian approximation, uh, and you know, and that was, you know, that seemed plausible, and so I had some clear expectations on what would happen, and the work that's shown here was just done to, uh, you know, to to essentially test that expectation. Okay, so uh, what was done, we did some trial simulations, uh, this, so the trials were simulated using R. Uh, use the same model and parameter es estimates as were done with by Kelson et al. Uh, in the papers you just saw. Uh, this involves simulating trial designs that had four dose arms. Uh, you can see the dose levels here. They had 250 patients per arm, four observations per patient. It was baseline plus three post-baseline post observations, and 100 trial replicates for each one of the scenarios. Okay, this is the, the model uh, that was used, and again, it's the same model that Kelson et al. had used. Uh, so again, it's a four, level score, four levels of scores, uh, and it particularly took on values of 0, 1, 2, or 3. Uh, and the score on the ith occasion in the jth individual, so we'll call that y sub ij, described as you see here using a cumulative logit model. Now in this instance I stuck with the same convention they used where they use the inequality in this form. They use the greater than or equal to uh, convention here. So we've got our yij is categorical. Uh, again we've got our vector of probabilities here. So the mth element of that vector then uh, is just the probability that y equals m given all of our model parameters and our covariates. And in this case I broke out the model parameters sort of between the fixed and random effects. So we've got theta is our fixed effects, uh, omega is, an, is a uh, standard deviation associated with inter-individual variation, uh, and then our covariates here are just dose and time. Uh, again that's broken out uh, using the uh, 
uh, using the difference here to put it in terms of uh, cumulative probabilities. I suppose these are, I don't know, maybe I should call them anti-cumulative since it's the reverse one. Uh, in addition, there's a inter-individual variability introduced uh, about that. Uh, well, in here, so our, our probability here is actually normally distributed about some mean uh, and variance where the mean here is uh, is the model you see down here. And what am I missing here? Oh, you know what I'm missing? I apologize. I've written this incorrectly. Uh, this should be written. Let me see if I can scribble it in. Uh, trying to write on a screen is always difficult in making it legible here. Um, yeah, this should be Logit of that probability is normally distributed like that. So apologies there. I'll try and remember to correct that uh, before I put it back out. So anyway, so we are. It is going to be again cumulative logit. So that needs to be a logit. Uh, and then this mu over here is this uh, more or less linear uh, model here. Uh, it's written slightly differently. Again, I've used the conventions that Kelson had all writ wrote it here. But this sum of theta k's here, this is our intercept term. So this is what I was calling calling alpha m uh, before. Uh, and, and it's parameterized in such a way that I guess it would be what? Yeah, theta 2 and theta 3 uh, have to be less than 0 in this case in order to maintain the appropriate ordering of these. Because in general, what we want is we want this sequence of sums uh, to be decreasing. And the way we do that is by enforcing that on these, on these terms here. Uh, and then on the right, we have, uh, we have, I guess basically we have the possibility of a, sort of a, an instant effect uh, that you might call a placebo effect. So here, this i, t i j greater than zero is just a um, is an indicator variable. So it will be zero at the baseline. It will be one for any post baseline values. And notice we've actually got another bump here. This theta four. With, so if for any post baseline values, there'll be an immediate uh, change uh, introduced, even for the placebo treatment. Uh, and then here you've got a linear dose effect on the logit of our probabilities here. And then we list the, the parameter values that are used for the simulations. Now the, the original authors picked these uh, to give the model certain properties. And in particular, they picked them in such a way that the expected fraction of the baseline scores had certain properties. What they wanted is they wanted one case where the probabilities for all of the scores were roughly equal at baseline. And that's what they got here. Basically, they just tweaked the uh, parameters until they got something that was kind of like that. So they were all pretty close to 0.25, so they ran with that one. And then they wanted two cases that were where they were roughly the same as each other and were such that one of the scores was very predominant and the others were relatively rare. And that's what you see here. They Again, they tweak the parameters until they had a case where, where you can see what you've got here, where we've got uh, the zero score is quite predominant, you know, more than 95% here, 96.5% of the values would be zeros, and all the rest of the scores were relatively rare. Uh, for that case. And so they pick these parameters that you see above to have that property. The other property they wanted is they wanted to compare the impact of the size of the uh, of the inter-individual variability on uh, on on this quantity here. So by the way, this is equ essentially equivalent to putting inter-individual variability on the intercept term uh, in here. And so they picked, so they set it up so that you had an omega squared of 4, which is pretty small, and then one of 40. So they had a very large contrast there. Okay, so that's the model they're working with. And we were too. 
uh, implemented in a non-MAM. I wasn't going to go through this in, in much detail since we're going to be working in our own case with, whoops, where to go? Hit the button. Okay. Uh, we're going to be working here. Uh, so, but you can kind of see for those of you used to non-MAM ease here, uh, the elements in here, we've got this I post here is essentially equivalent to that I sub TIJ greater than zero uh, indicator uh, here. So you can see you've got an I, it's either zero or if time is greater than zero, uh, I post equals one. Uh, here you've got our treatment effect component that's equivalent to that uh, component where we had that indicator times theta four plus theta five times dose. Uh, here it's constructing the uh, our cumulative probabilities or our anti-cumulative in a sense uh, so we've got our you know this lpq1 would be the probability that or it's the logit of the probability that um, that y is greater than or equal to one now oh, i guess i wrote it right over there uh, and so that one includes our uh, our drug effect component in here uh, it also includes our, our random effect term, so that's our inter-individual variation term. And then you've got the theta 1 uh, term stuck on that. And the rest of them are, are simply constructed by uh, bringing in the other components. Uh, the reason this is set up with the exponentials this way, the theta 2 and theta 3 can take on any value. So these aren't quite the same as the parameterizations in the other page. Uh, they're set up in such a way that theta 2 or theta 3 can be anywhere on the real line, but by taking the exponent, you end up with something which is uh, greater than or equal to 0 in here and, and subtracts those from those to introduce the correct ordering on the intercept terms, uh, takes the anti logit of those. Uh, from the cumulative probabilities, converts them back to the probabilities for each score level in here, and then finally pulls the likelihood together from that. Uh, and then with non-MEM, uh, at least uh, non-MEM 6, then what you need to do in order to do this is you have to use the likelihood option in the estimation step, so you see that, plus the Laplacian method as part of it, so you got likelihood, Laplacian, and conditional uh, are necessary elements then uh, to do this in non-MIM. Okay, so now for uh, the open bugs implementation, and though again I used open bugs here, the win bugs implementation would be uh, identical, at least in terms of the model, uh, the, uh, the model file. Okay, so uh, they were we had analyzed this using open bugs. Uh, the link to R in this case, instead of using R to win bugs like we've been using, I use Brugs. Uh, in that case, uh, again, the model was identical to that used for simulation, except that we've also now introduced some prior distributions as part of this, though there we stuck with very weakly informative priors. Uh, for MCMC, we use three chains, burn in for just over 4,000 and 5,010, and I can't for the for the life of me remember why I came up with 5,010 instead of 5,000, but I did. Anyway, post burn in samples per chain. Uh, and this is breaking out the model into its pieces. So we've got the model. Uh, so we've got a component here for uh, taking care of our inter-individual variability. So I'm uh, still using sort of non mames here. So I called it an eta which comes from a normal distribution with a precision term to describe the inter-individual variability. Uh, and this is uh, now going over our observations, and this is where the core part is to deal with the cumulative probabilities then. So for our score, uh, now this is similar. Now remember with binary data, we would have had the uh, Bernoulli distribution here. Uh, that Well, you can think of really the Decat or the categorical distribution is really being just a, you know, is being a an analog to the Bernoulli. It's so it's essentially a Bernoulli, but for more than two uh, uh, two possible cases. So I've got my score. Uh, so the, the in the data set there would be a value for score, which 
which would have values. Uh, now the way I have to set it up with WinBugs is it assumes the score starts at 1. So what was 0 to 3 in the original uh, data I would have to convert to 1 to 4 in order to use it in WinBugs. So the score values will take on values of 1 to 4. Uh, they will so and they're associated with a categorical likelihood here. Uh, we have a an array here uh, that contains our probabilities. Uh, so for so you, the way this is going to be structured here then is that I'm going to have a different p uh, vector for every observation in here. So you can think of it as being a matrix with n obs rows and four columns. The four columns correspond to the four different score levels. So each row represents a, a set of probabilities which sum to one in here. Uh, and so inside the model I'm going to be picking off the ith row in here. By the way, it also has to be in this order. If I, if I tried to structure this the other way around where it had four rows and n obs columns uh, it would not operate correctly and essentially that has to do with the way uh, the data is stored under the hood. It needs to be in adjacent uh, storage locations in the computer for it to work properly with the uh, uh, when you pass it as a variable. This vector is a variable into this function, the dcat function. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, but now we have to construct those probabilities. Uh, let's actually go to the bottom here where we're constructing it. We're constructing the cumulative probabilities. So again, we've got our logit of our cumulative probability. In this case, we're going to start again with our score equal to 1. Uh, and on the right-hand side is just an implementation of our uh, logistic regression model. So we've got our intercept term uh, plus our uh, our effect here, or essentially our placebo effect theta 4 plus our drug effect theta 5 times dose uh, times uh, this term here in parentheses uh, right here is equivalent again to that i sub tij is greater than or equal to 0. So this function here equals uh, takes two values as arguments and if they're equal it will return a 1. If they're not equal it returns a 0. So here I've got I, where I put equals time i 0. So if time i equals 0 it says ah that's a baseline uh, that'll set this equal to 1 and 1 minus 1 will be 0 and this term, this second term won't apply. It'll just return the theta 1. On the other hand for any other time it's going to return a it'll return a one here, uh, and we'll have both our uh, placebo and drug effect coming in, and then finally the last term here is our random effect, our patient-specific random effect. And as I've shown before, for our population models, I need to have a data item which will be an integer, uh, in this case describing our patient. Uh, so it'll, so somewhere inside the data set will be a set of integers from 1 up to the number of patients in here in our data set and it'll use those values to pick off the appropriate eta. Uh, so that takes care of our probability that uh, the score is greater than or equal to 1 uh, and then to get the the, remain, the other terms where it's greater than or equal to 2, greater than or equal to 3, I just add on my my additional components, my theta 2 and theta 3, uh, which in this case represent the differences. So theta 2 is actually the difference between, if we, if we again, if we think of our, um, our, the way we wrote the model originally with alpha representing our intercept, so we're going to want, uh, i got to keep the direction straight here, so we're going to want, because uh, we've got a greater than, and i got to keep it straight here. So we've got theta 2 and, th well, theta 2 and theta 3 in this case have to be negative. Okay, so they're going to be the differences here between the subsequent uh, intercepts here in order to have these ordered correctly. And in this case, because the um, 
inequality is a greater than the the second term here has to be smaller than the first and the third term has to be smaller than the second and assuming I did that correctly let's see what do we got here we've got our prior distributions this is actually where I introduce some of the constraints uh, generally uh, fairly uh, weakly informative so theta 1 you can see is normal 0 10 to the what's well, this is a precision of 10 to the minus 5 so that would be a variance of 10 to the fifth uh, similar for theta 2 and theta 3 but I want those restricted to be negative and the way I did that uh, is I uh, trying to remember if any of the examples if I've shown you this I used uh, the I modifier on these uh, what the I modifier does and you have to be a little careful with how you use it but uh, in a case like this where I've got a just a prior distribution and I introduce this this is actually creating a truncated distribution and in particular what I've taken is a relatively flat normal centered at minus one and truncated it on the right hand side so so it will re only return values less than zero and I do the same thing for theta three alternatively I could have used some something where I took advantage of a log normal where I created a log normal variable and used its negative uh, and that would be another strategy I could have used here uh, and then we've got our again our other theta is again fairly uh, weakly informative uh, we and then we have the sigma eta here actually I called that omega in the uh, in the equations before that's the standard deviation of the inter individual variation in our intercept I used a fairly wide uh, uniform for that okay so that was what was implemented uh, and the results that we see with this uh, so um, here orient is so we've got bias uh, on the y-axis uh, the top group of panels here are non-mem results the bottom are the bugs results uh, using MCMC uh, now what we can see is case one that's the one where we had a relatively small inter-individual variation and a uh, uh, and roughly equal probabilities for each each score at baseline and notice in this case that there isn't a whole lot of difference uh, between the two they both you know have roughly equivalent performance at least in terms of bias uh, when we go to case two where we had this the greater skewness uh, in terms of the uh, the distributions now we're starting to see some indications of a bias you know, albeit at a relatively low level uh, here occurring with non-mem uh, that's that's not apparent with the MCMC and then finally for case 3 where not only do we have skewness but we have large inter-individual variability uh, we start seeing some fairly significant instances of bias and that's particularly true for our uh, the standard deviation for inter-individual variation here oops push the wrong button okay uh, we can also talk in terms of not just bias but precision uh, so here I'm looking at the root mean square error and in particular I did it as relative uh, root mean uh, square error in here uh, so I've got to remember what I meant by relative root mean square error um, relative to what Uh, okay I'm gonna have to go back and remind myself relative to what uh, but but at least it should be uh, in the right ordering here uh, what you'll see here is the MCMC results are here in the I guess what is that cyan and then non mem and magenta here uh, and again in case one which is the lower left there isn't much difference between the two cases uh, but when we look at case two and case three here uh, there's clearly a uh, 
you know, clearly some improvement uh, with MCMC relative to the non Memlaplacian method, uh, you know, particularly when we get to case three. Uh, and then here, this is looking at what happens if you use these models to simulate outcomes uh, and you compare the simulated outcomes for our estimated uh, parameters relative, or I'm sorry, our estimated outcomes versus uh, when we just simulate directly from the model that was used to generate the initial simulations. That's what we're calling true here. Uh, and we look at the the fractions of outcomes at the different score levels here. Uh, so you can see here the colors represent the different score levels. So we got 0, 1, 2, and 3 in here. And then they're done as stacked by bar charts uh, in this. Uh, and we've got sort of as we go up uh, the panels here from by the bottom is making simulations of baseline. Uh, the middle one is simulations of placebo, and the top one is simulating the outcomes for the highest dose uh, in these. Sorry, I got a question that I went by here. Hopefully that hasn't been sitting there too long. Oh, okay, Andreas, you were probably trying to get straight what I had actually uh, done in the previous uh, plot over here. Yeah, it might have been what it was, but I'm not sure, Andres. Um Been too long since I did it. Um, anyway, so we, we're plotting these, and as we go across on the x-axis, we're looking at uh, the first bar is the uh, simulations based on the MCMC model. Uh, the second one is based on the non-MEM, and the right hand is the true. So the right hand one in each case is the one we're comparing to. Now, if we take a look at our... And, and we're and then we've got case one, case two, case three as we go from left to right. Uh, so case one again was the situation where the roughly equal probabilities at least at at baseline. And uh, if you look across here, there's not a whole lot of difference to be seen amongst any of these. If we go to case two, that's our our center set here. Again, there's not a whole lot to distinguish those. There's maybe when I look at the highest dose. There's maybe a hint of, of some bias appearing in the simulated outcomes, uh, you know, especially when I look up here for non-MEM. But it's not very large in comparison um, here. But there is some, uh, some indication there. Where things really jump out at you is in the um, extreme case here, our case three, which is where we have the high, we have not, a, we have both highly skewed outcomes as well as high inter-individual variability and in this case if we compare to truth you can see that uh, consistently the MCMC results are very comparable to truth but the uh, but in the center here uh, the non-mem results is consistently uh, quite biased uh, relative to truth and in particular it's overestimating the frequency of occurrence in the of the rare uh, outcomes uh, in this. So there, there's clearly a problem uh, when using that Laplacian approximation for doing this type of model. Um, so let's just sort of I guess summarize here sort of what what at the time at least I saw as the case for doing I, I for doing well for doing Bayesian modeling of ordinal data using MCMC uh, one was better estimation and prediction performance than methods using linear Laplacian approximation of the likelihood and that's that's actually not a function of the Bayesian aspects that's a function of the using in the MCMC method uh, it's not the Bayesian aspects per se that make the difference uh, and that's probably the most key one um, in terms of the outcomes here. The rest of this might have been uh, just trying to sell the Bayesian approach, I guess. Uh, I say yields an estimate of the entire joint posterior distribution, which gives you a description of your model parameters and, uh, and any derived quantities like your predictions. are Those are easily obtained for M MCMC samples in particular. That's easier to do it with that than it is with the sort of two-stage inference process that occurs when you're using maximum likelihood. 
um, you know, you can ease, and the other aspect that's more key to uh, uh, Bayesian is you can easily and rigorously include prior information, though that, that has nothing to do with why we saw differences just now. Uh, and the available to, tools, particularly those that use the bugs model specification language, are uh, provide a nice flexible model specification setting here. So you've got a nice rich collection of built-in probability distributions and no limit on levels of variability. So as I say, some of that was sort of pitching at, you know, I guess I was trying to make the case for using Bayesian modeling with wind bugs at the time. Uh, but in terms of explaining the differences we saw, uh, the main one is the fact that we're not using the kind of approximations that are associated with the Laplacian approximation uh, with non-MEM. Let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Got the con question here. Any words about performance if you use simulated annealing or new methods in non-MEM7? Uh, I don't have any. I, I don't have enough experience or knowledge about simulated annealing. Uh, but in terms of other a uh, new methods in non-MEM7, that's actually. I was going to comment on that later, but I can just go ahead and do it now. Is that's one reason why this is a little bit long in the tooth is because there are new methods available in non-MEM7, uh, also in, in Monolix, for example, that don't make the same kind of approximations as the Laplacian method. For example, the, uh, the SAEM algorithm uh, is not making um, the approximations of the likelihood in this sense. So, though I haven't worked with it directly for these kinds of problems, it, it should do, you know, it, it should perform well. Uh, with these kinds of problems, it should do at least as well as the Gaussian quadrature, I would expect. Uh, and in fact, under the hood of uh, the current implementations of SAEM in both Monolix and non-MEM is an MCMC methodology. Uh, so in a sense, it's an MCMC method directed at a maximum likelihood strategy uh, rather than a Bayesian strategy. So in addition, of course, non-MEM 7 now has a now has an MCMC method available for for Bayesian analysis as part of it. In fact, that particular algorithm takes advantage of the same MCMC tools that were put in there for doing SAEM. Uh, and again, those would perform quite well on this problem. They do do at least equivalent to uh, what you see with non-MEM. I'm sorry, what you see with wind bugs. Uh, let's see, well, in the case against Bayesian modeling, mostly had to do with computation time. I won't even go through the, the details of what I've got here, but that was the main issue here, is, uh, is the need for more computation time uh, than methodologies that are directed at just getting point estimates. Oh, I see, that's what you were seeing. Act uh, see, that's what you meant by simulated annealing was the SAEM method. Okay. Um, let me see how far we can get here. I've actually already hit our time boundary. Um, let me just... Uh, let me just sort of quickly step through this next two slides here, I guess, and then and then we'll escape here. Uh, these don't take much time anyway here. Uh, just wanted to mention that there are generalizations of the cumulative logit model here uh, that can be created by using links other than the logit link. Uh, so so that's what I'm mentioning here as other cumulative link models. Uh, so it's just comments here, then models for ordinal data can be constructed using link functions other than the logit. So if we just write out uh, the model in terms like this, so I've got some function g, you know, which uh, would, logit would be one possible example, but uh, it could be something else. So, so we take that, whatever transformation that is, apply it to our 
cumulative probability. Our right hand side is the same, our intercept minus our, our, our model function here uh, with the, again, our, our ordered uh, intercept terms. Well, we can construct other models like that where G is something else. In fact, G could be, uh, in principle, it could be the in inverse of any, uh, any continuous cumulative distribution function. Uh, you know, but in particular, a couple that are commonly used uh, for things would be so-called cumulative probit models. In that case, G is the inverse of a standard normal cumulative distribution function. So, and I've just written that out here. Uh, another category is to use complementary log-log models where G is the inverse CDF of what's called the extreme value distribution. And here it's actually easier to write the uh, G directly rather than try to write it in terms of the uh, inverse of the CDF. So those are both fairly commonly used. Now when you use them you lose the um, you lose the proportional odds property, but they all, but it's been argued in some cases that they have other uh, desirable properties. Uh, other generalizations can be generated instead of using that, writing the model thinking in that terms, is they can be generated uh, based upon the latent variable interpretation of, of our cumulative logit models. So you could imagine a whole range of models that you can construct based upon some underlying continuous model, uh, you know, that uses distributions other than the logistic distribution uh, in there. So where, so you, again, you could have some underlying model, you would, you would have a score dependent upon what interval of continuous variables that this underlying latent quantity takes on. Uh, and I just argue that that can be a conceptually attractive approach if there is some mechanistic, mechanistic rationale. For example, you might have some, there might be some causal relationship between some well understood but unobserved continuous response, perhaps some physiologic response that, again, you know is happening and you may have some a uh, reasonable model for describing it, but you may have no direct observations of it in your particular experiment, uh, but you may have reason to believe that there's a sort of a direct relationship between that and your observed ordinal variable, uh, and in which case you could use, you could relate those two using a latent variable model. And I think that's that's where I'm going to drop you off. I'm going to suggest, um, let's see, what are we going to do for Thursday? Let me think about this. Because uh, I don't necessarily want to take all of the time necessary to go through our example three. Um, or maybe I should. Uh, I guess if you can either stick with me or come back and listen to uh, to the recording later on, maybe I should go ahead and actually describe our hands-on problem three and we can spend some time on that this Thursday. Uh, that was kind of the original intention for today anyway was to get through this. So our hands-on problem three again is going to be a, an example using longitudinal ordinal data. Uh, so we're going back to our theme here of our cystic fibrosis uh, case here. So we're going to have a situation where at each visit during a phase three confirmatory trial, uh, the patients indicated whether their health-related quality of life, uh, which we'll call HRQOL, was worse, unchanged, or better than it was prior to the trial. So what we're describing there are eight, is a situation where HRQOL then is a three-level ordinal scale. Um, you know, the exploratory analysis indicates that HRQOL initially worsens for those patients that are assigned to, to our ME2 compared to those on placebo, and I hint that usually maybe that's because of the coughing, uh, but it improves over time. And we'll, we'll explore that then by fitting a longitudinal cumul cumul ah, cumulative logit model to our HRQOL data that's observed in the study. 
Uh, so we're looking at a trial now. Uh, it's a phase three trial. Uh, we've, it's parallel. We've got 250 patients per arm, multiple doses of ME2. Uh, we're just going to have two treatments. It's, we've got placebo and uh, a placebo arm and a 40 milligram per day arm uh, where the drug's administered by inhalation over 24 weeks. Uh, our HRQOL measurement, again, is a three-level ordinal scale, worse, unchanged, or better, that's reported every four weeks. And your uh, hands-on exercise will be to construct a model for that HRQOL score as a function of dose and time. Uh, there's a data set uh, that should be in your, uh, in your directories there in hands-on three. You can see it's called ME2QOL data. Uh, just give you some visualization of that data. Uh, now, of course, each person will have a score, you know, at the various times will have a score of, uh, you know, of either worse, unchanged, or better. Uh, here what I've done is I've taken some summary statistics of that. In particular, I've calculated the fraction of patients who report uh, each score level and plot that versus time for our placebo and 40 milligram group here. And you can see in the placebo case, uh, by the way, here you can see better is green, unchanged black, and worse is, uh, is red. So you can see in our, our placebo group, uh, you start out with roughly 20% uh, are, are you know, by, at the first, well, from the first uh, um, visit on, say they're worse, about 30% say they're better, and about 50% say that nothing happened, you know, that's unchanged. Uh, and then if we look at the drug-treated case, uh, we've got, uh, yeah, well, let's start out, I guess, with uh, unchanged here. You can see it's a little bit of a bounce at the beginning, and then it tends to go down. Uh, if we look at worse, which is our red, uh, initially we've got, what, about 35% of patients reporting worse, uh, and then it goes down with time and appears to roughly level off here uh, over time with, uh, oh, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 15% uh, reporting uh, that they're worse. And finally, we see a, tr a trend in here where the number of patients reporting better is going up after an uh, after sort of an initial drop here at the beginning so compared with the placebo group uh, so that's looking at it from the individual score level now you're going to be constructing a cumulative logit model so it's useful to think in terms of this or at least to visualize it in terms of that cumulative logit so what I've plotted is the fraction of patients that report values less than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to 2, which is actually in this case, I guess that's less than or equal to, which way did I scale it? Um, I think I went from uh, 1 being worse and better being, I'm sorry, yeah, and 3 being better. I'm trying to remember which way I did it. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, I even marked it. Sorry, okay, it's worse or worse or unchanged. So those are our cumulative cases here. Uh, and I've got, on, so I've plotted here is just the fraction of patients that way. Now our model is constructed in logit terms, so I took the same information but plotted the logit of that fraction of patients so we can see that uh, and one one of the first things we can do with this is under our model assuming these patient groups here are roughly the same in terms of their covariates on average we would expect when we go look at this over time we would expect that the differences here uh, would be, you know, would be pretty much, stay pretty much the same. And at least roughly speaking, that looks like that's the case over here. So at least on a real crude look at uh, proportional odds, it looks like uh, there's nothing here to argue against using proportional odds yet. Okay, so we're basically going to be constructing a model for what you see in this plot. Uh, and the model is, is suggested here where we're looking at the uh, cumulative logit then for HRQOL. 
uh, on the ICE visit and JATH patient. So again, our, uh, our score here is going to be described by a categorical distribution. Uh, we convert this to a cumulative logit model, and I use the less than or equal to convention here. Uh, I'm going to have our core model then. Uh, you've got our intercept term here plus our, our function and broke that out in terms of a component related to placebo and a component related to drug and a single random effect here associate you can asso sort of associate that with the our uh, intercept term here our placebo here i've just made uh as just a simple proportion model proportional to time I suppose you could argue maybe I should also throw an intercept on there. Uh, I did not in this case, but if you want to explore that, you could. Uh, now, if we go back and look at our data, it looks like the placebo is doing almost nothing in terms of an effect over time, but this allows for the possibility of some general trend. So I'll incorporate that. Uh, then for the drug effect term here, I've got, uh, this is just an indicator that, so if, for the placebo case, this this term should all go to zero. For the non-placebo case, we have the possibility of an immediate effect by this intercept term, and then a quantity here which uh, is changing over time. Uh, and finally, just a normally distributed random effect term in here. And um, you know, and then we've got. Uh, the prior specified, in this case, they're all weekly informative. Uh, the one thing, and then the uh, the required uh, order constraint on the alphas is is handled right here. So I'm using it. Uh, I'm saying use a truncated normal. So it's going to be a uh, you use as, as the core part of it. You're going to use a uh, just a fairly flat normal here but require but restrict the possible values to um, to uh, for the difference here between alpha 2 and alpha 1 to being uh, greater than 0 uh, so that will that'll take care of the appropriate ordering on that I think yep I think with that I'm gonna send you off uh, to explore that model and we'll go over that then uh, during our session on Thursday. Uh, any last questions before I let you go? And somebody caught me up on making the same mistake. I suspect I did a cut and paste here. Uh, Dana spotted uh, an, the same mistake I made before. Uh, that's annoying. Uh, and that's that this... Yeah, I must have cut and pasted it. That's one of the problems of cutting and pasting. So uh, this should be the logit of this probability is the term that you see on the right. Thanks for spotting that. Uh, I'm taking your comments there, Andreas, as, as, as a suggestion for discussion on model diagnostics and goodness of fit. And in fact, I don't think I included too much on that. So uh, uh, that's something. Let me look into that. I can't remember what I included in, uh, in my solution script to this one. So I'll double check and see if I've got... Uh, anything uh, good to point out to you in that, but that would be, uh, I agree, that would be useful for people to see. Uh, some, by the way, some of those diagnostics are going to be exactly the same things we looked at in the binary case, uh, but I'll, I'll try and make sure we've got something useful uh, in our discussion on Thursday to, uh, in terms of doing model diagnostics for a model like this.
Okay, uh, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and escape and let you do the same and uh, talk to you again on Thursday. Bye for now.